looks like you're missing a semicolon. Huh? Oh. Uh, you know, okay. Oh, wait. There we go. There we go. So anyway, so the point is you can actually modify this code a lot, which is great, right? You can see how it's a very useful tutorial. Anyway, hero this. Great guy. Okay. And if you guys want, you know, it's a great way to learn JavaScript. I know you guys know it, but you can practice it. Anyway, so that's Mr. John Rezik, and uh, jQuery is licensed under MIT, so feel free to use it. Up. By the way, do you guys know the differences between the licenses? Do you know which licenses you're supposed to use and which, like Apache, MIT, BSD, those are okay. What is this? Be careful about GPL. Uh, GPL is, uh, is great for open source, but if you're doing production grade applications where you don't want to open source your code, be a little careful because um, I'm not a lawyer. I don't know too much of this detail, but I do know that I, at IBM, for example, um, they were very careful about which libraries we used and which licenses they had. GPL has this thing where if you use it in your code, you have to make your code also open source. Okay. So if you use it in production, be careful. So really, so Apache, MIT, BSD, MIT, I think I said MIT. These are all very friendly licenses. These are the kind of licenses where, as long as you include the license for their library in your code, you can use it no problem. Okay, and it has no effect on the code that you write. Okay, so jQuery is MIT, right? So it's very friendly. Okay, so what is jQuery? Well, jQuery can be boiled down to a function. That's all basically jQuery is. It's a function. And specifically in the library, what you will see if you look at the source of jQuery is something like this. Window.jQuery equals window.dollar equals jQuery. So I said that jQuery is a function, right? So the function is, a, is assigned to the dollar value, which is global, right? Windows the global namespace, dollar, and the word jQuery. So jQuery is one of the few libraries that will actually contribute two global variables rather than just one. Right, so YUI, Dojo, all these libraries will usually contribute just one. jQuery does two. Be very careful about using this in the global scope. Why? Well, think of it this way. The word jQuery is pretty long, right? And the probability of someone coming along and naming their library jQuery or naming their variable jQuery, unless they're actually using jQuery, the probability is pretty low, I would say. But Dollar sign is a very simple, small variable. So it's very easy for someone to just use dollar sign accidentally and then override what's in the global namespace. So globally, if you're going to use jQuery, refer to it as jQuery, not as dollar. We'll see examples of how to do that in a bit. Okay. Can everybody see this? Yes? Okay. So. How do we use jQuery? It's very easy. Well, first we have to include the library. Everyone knows how to do that, right? So script, source, loads, done. Great. Okay, so let's get into it. So notice, in the global namespace, I'm using jQuery, not dollar. jQuery, right? So I'm calling jQuery, and what I'm doing is, remember, jQuery is a function. As an argument, I'm giving it a reference to document. Okay, so document is a reference to the root of the DOM. Okay? So I give it a reference to the document and I do dot ready. What does ready mean? Ready means that the DOM has fully loaded and is sort of ready to execute. Okay? It's, it's, kind of, it's on the page. Um, it's gone through the reflow and repaint and it's there. And you can actually manipulate it. Okay? When it's ready, it will call the function you give it. Now here's the interesting thing. When it calls your function, it will give you, as an argument, a reference to itself. Let me say that again. You call jQuery, which is a function, you give it a document. Right? When that document is ready, it will call the function you give it, and it will pass a reference to jQuery, to that same function, locally. Now, you can call this whatever you want. You can call this Petros, Provos. doesn't really matter. Right? But traditionally, jQuery, when used locally, you use the 
the dollar sign to refer to it. That is kind of the standard way that people code, right? So generally speaking, you want to use dollar sign, okay? So again, this is the same thing as that. Question so far? This is clear? Good, okay. So we have the dollar sign. Then what we can do is, so what is dollar sign? Well, it's the function, it's the jQuery function. And what does the jQuery function take in as arguments? Well, first we saw that it can take in a DOM element, right? Like document. Okay. What else can it take? Well, it can take a string, specifically a CSS selector. Okay. So, uh, how many people here do not know CSS? Just no. Ooh, one person does not know CSS. Okay. Two people do not know CSS. You have some homework to do. Okay. But. Um, so, see, okay, so very quickly, so CSS consists of basically two parts, okay? It has a query, which is the selector, okay? This is the part that tells you which elements to pick. And then it has the actual parameters, which say how to affect those elements. That's it, that's all CSS is, okay? So, what we can do is specify that selector query inside of here. Now, for those of you who do know CSS, what does li match? Which kind of elements? <laughs> list items, exactly, perfect. So this will match all list items in the document, right, in the DOM. So what this is saying is call this function and select or pick out all of the elements that match this query. It's like you're doing a query against the DOM. Okay, that's basically what you're doing. And what it will return to you is what is known as a jQuery object. Now a jQuery object looks a lot like an array. It has a dot length, it, it has you know zero index, first index, second index of every element that was selected. But it's actually not an array. So if you do is array of the jQuery object, it will return false. It's not actually an array. But it looks like an array. So it has a length, you can iterate over it using a for loop. For all intents and purposes, you can use it as an array. Okay. So here in LIS, we have the jQuery object. Now what we can do is we can, as I mentioned, iterate over it. It has a dot length of the number of DOM elements that are in that jQuery object. So we're, we have a for loop, bar i equals zero, blah, 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 length i plus plus, you know this. All I'm doing here is just printing out LIS index of i dot inner HTML. If you recall what inner HTML is, it will, for a given element, return to you all the content inside. If it was inner <laughs> HTML of OL, it would return all of this stuff, all of this, as a string, right? So what I'm doing here is I'm printing out for each one, LIS, uh, yeah, inner HTML. There we go. <laughs> this is the actual HTML. This is the stuff that I'm writing. Okay? This can, okay, this is a little I'll fix this problem right now. I will add an HR. Okay, that thin line is what I added. Okay, so this is what we're printing. Okay, yeah. You threw me off there, All right? And the number of elements. And the number of elements, so the dot length, will give you three. Right? So there are three elements that were selected. Here are their inner HTMLs, and the length is three. So far, very easy, right? We have a function, we can give it a selector. It will go into the DOM, find all the elements that match this selector, put it into a jQuery object, which is like an array, but not really an array. And then we can iterate over those elements and print them on the screen. Questions? One way to think about this is when you, when you call jQuery, jQuery gets the elements, packs them up for you into this jQuery object, and then gives you that object. Okay, so think of it that way. Okay, so CSS selectors. You can use 
all the selectors that you guys know, right? You can reference things by ID using hash. You can reference elements. You can reference, you know, this means li, which is underneath ul, right? Um, you can also do um, property. Who doesn't know the syntax? <coughs> ah, a few people. Okay. So in CSS, what you can do is, suppose in your DOM you have something like this. Um, so you guys know class selectors. So if I do this and I say foo, uh, foo, in CSS, that would, to select that, it would be dot foo, right? Select everything of this class name. You can also do parameters. So you can say data, no, it's just not even data, just bar, okay? What you can do is you can select everything that has a bar. That will give you this and this. Okay, both of these will match this, but then if I say bar equals foo, it will only match this one, but not this one. Okay, so it allows you to match any arbitrary properties. Okay, so that's what that was, for those of you who did not do. Okay. Now, here's the thing. If you guys notice, the very first example was not a CSS selector, it was an actual DOM element, right? It was the document. So in addition to giving it uh, a query, which is a string, you can also give it an actual DOM element. And it will basically, it, so the function is overloaded. It will look at what it got. It will say, is this a string? If it is, it will look to see if it's um, an HTML string. We'll talk about that later. If it's not, is it a selector? If it is a selector, it will go and find the elements, pack them up, return them. If it's an element, it will just wrap that element and return that. You can also give it an array of elements. That works too. It will take all of those elements, wrap them up into this jQuery object, return the jQuery object. So in this case, if I have two elements, if I did dot like on the jQuery object that was returned, what would be the value? Two. That's right. So one, two, each of these elements would be wrapped in the jQuery object, returned, it would have a dot length of two. Okay. There's um, a second thing that's kind of cool. The function can take a second argument. So the second argument is the element relative to which the query is conducted. So if you don't specify this, it will try to find everything in the entire DOM that matches this selector. In other words, all elements that have foo as a class will be matched. In this example, it will find this element and then only do the query underneath that element, not the entire DOM. When is this useful? Well, imagine if you're building Facebook. Okay? You guys are building Facebook. Now, Facebook is not one thing, right? It's composed of lots of little sort of mini applications, right? There's the news feed, there's the messaging system, there's all these various parts. Now, if you're writing one of these parts, you want control over that part. The last thing you want to do is accidentally select the entire DOM and modify something in a completely different section of Facebook. Right? You want to be have, if you're writing the messaging system, you want to be able to modify the messaging system without modifying the news feed. Right? So what you would do is you would find the root of the messaging system and do all your queries relative to that, not actually touching the rest of the DOM. That's when that would be important. Um, so the second argument can actually be an actual DOM element. You can also actually give it a jQuery object. That's cool too. Now remember, a jQuery object can have more than one thing in it, right? So what that means is that you can have this query run relative to not one, but a set of things. You get it? So instead of running the query just on this, you can run the query relative to this, this, and this. sort of standard way of starting a document. You call jQuery with document. When the document is ready, in other words, the DOM has sort of loaded and is ready to go, we get this function with a reference to jQuery. Then we take that dollar and we select label. What will this select? <coughs> All labels. That's right. <coughs> Which up here you would see are, actually it's just this one, one thing. This one, right? 
we'll select that. And then we do dot HTML. Now, if you remember in the native DOM, we have dot inner HTML, which if you read from it, if you do inner HTML and then you assign it to a variable, will return to you the inner HTML as a string. But if you assign it, if you do inner HTML equals or assignment some string, it will take that string and put it into that element, right? jQuery just says HTML. No inner HTML, just HTML. And it's a function. And if you call the function, just call it, it will return the inner HTML. If you pass the content, it will set that as the inner HTML of the element. Now here's an important little, actually I'll get to that in a moment. So, what does this do? This says, okay, select everything that has the class MSG. Okay? So let's see. Well, it's this one. This element is selected, wrapped up into a jQuery object, and returned. Now, if we do dot text, so there's HTML, and then there's text. What's the difference? The difference is, is that text will actually add like a text element. In other words, if you specify HTML in your string, it will render as a string. It won't try to parse it and turn it into a DOM. In other words, if I were to specify, so this is some content, right? Some content here. If I were to set some content with a break, it will actually print break. Whereas the HTML, which is this, if I were to put in a BR here, notice it actually executes it. So inner HTML will actually parse and execute the HTML you give it. Text will only render exactly as if you have it. It won't try to interpret it and turn it into an executable DOM. Why is this important? This is actually really important. Be careful about doing this. Why? Because this can have script tags in it. And if you add a script tag to your DOM, it will just run. Why does this matter? Well, where are you getting this text from? I don't know, the server. Where's the server getting the text from? I don't know, the database. Where's the database getting its data from? Well, someone filled out a form and submitted it and got into my database. How do you know who filled out the form? What if the person who filled out the form didn't write name, but instead they wrote name, script tag, and then a whole bunch of really, really bad stuff? What you've done is injected their attack into your application. This like is known as cross-site scripting. <coughs> we might do a security thing later, but be careful about doing this, okay? When you can, do this. Only do this if you really know what you're doing. If you're absolutely sure that this text that you're doing, setting the inner HTML of, is text that you wrote, not a user, because a user can do really bad things with this. Clear so far? Cool. So, there are other things we can do. We can set attributes. So in this case, we're selecting all elements that are of type input, and we are setting the title attribute to some string. What does title do? It adds a tooltip. So in this case, we have this is my title, and if I mouse over this guy, this is my title. You see that? That's it. Okay, so we can set the, H the inner HTML, we can set the inner text, which is the same thing except escaped, right? Uh, we can set an attribute, we can also modify the CSS. So here we're selecting MSG, which is this div right here, right? And then we're doing .css, we're changing the CSS to do uh, background light blue. Now if you recall, to do it natively, we would have to have some you know, uh, var dom element. And then we would, you know, once you actually select it somehow, either get element by ID or whatever, you would then do dom dot style dot uh, background equals light. You can see that this is kind of longer than that, right? And this, in fact, can be chained. Now what do I mean by this? This is actually really one of the really cool features about jQuery. It's a programming pattern, actually. Other libraries are also using this pattern now. And what it is is the following. When you call a function on jQuery, that function returns jQuery. Huh? Yeah, okay. So this, when you call it, 
this jQuery function, it returns to a jQuery object, right? So this is the same as doing this. returns the same thing, that jQuery object. What that allows us to do is, if we call a function, because it's returning the same thing, to call another function on it, and then call another function on it, and then call another function on it. So, if you look at this example, here I'm doing, I'm selecting all elements that match this class, and then I'm calling .css, and then that returns a jQuery object, which I can call .css on again. Okay. Quick note on the CSS function. So CSS function, you can pass in in two ways. You can either pass in the name, the, the name and the value. So in this case, background and light blue. Or if you're doing a whole series of these, you can actually just pass it an object, such as this. And in the object, you just pass in the key value pairs. Now, one interesting thing. Notice the syntax, how you can do font, dash, wait. In native CSS, uh, in native DOM, you're not allowed to do this. You have to use what's known as camel dance. You have to do font, uppercase W, wait. jQuery knows both. So you can either use uh, camel case here, or you can actually use the same thing you use in your, in, in your CSS, which is... Already, and then we also have a val. No, no, I'll tell you. Okay. Okay. So this is a cool one, guys. So remember, the word class is reserved in JavaScript, right? I think you, we might have mentioned this before. So we can't actually do some DOM element dot class even though we want to modify the class of the element. You can't do that. So what the native DOM forces you to do is something like this. If you have you know, var DOM that has a reference to an element, you have to do DOM.class name. Okay? Yeah. So class name is a reference to class. Basically, they could call it class, and they thought, well, what can we give it? And they just decided to call it class name. It's a stupid name, but this is what they called it. So class name will return to you a string that has all the classes in it separated by a space. So if you wanted to know, does this class exist, you have to call this, then you have to tokenize by a space, and then you have to iterate over the array looking for that string in that array. Kind of painful. If you wanted to add a class, you might have to concatenate using a space to an existing set classes. Okay? So this is very hard to use. So how does jQuery solve this problem? It encapsulates all of that logic inside of its function. So it has an add class function. So if you want to add class, you don't have to worry about concatenating and seeing is the, is the string empty? If so, I have to concatenate. If it's not empty, I have to concatenate with a space. If it is empty, I can just set my, all of that weird logic is abstracted away in this function. So all you do is, when you select a set of elements, you get a jQuery object. And on that jQuery object, you just do add class, the name of the class. That's it. Done. Now here's the cool thing. If this selector selects more than one thing, and you do add class, it will apply this operation on all the elements that were selected. This is really cool. Watch this. So, um, right, so the test class has a background of red, okay? And here I have a div with a class sample. Now suppose I copy this, and I paste it in a bunch of times, okay? Notice for every element, it added the class and made the background red. John.
So do that. Huh? So there's a library called D3. How many people here have used D3 or know what D3? Oh, a few, a few people. Okay, cool. So a D3 D3 stands for Data Driven Documents. It's a library, and it basically allows you to do using generally SVG um, various really cool visualizations, and it uses this kind of pattern. You select a set of elements, which are the existing elements, you bind them to some data set. And then for the amount of data that exists where there are not elements, you add them. For all the extra elements that exist outside of that set, you remove them. And then for the elements that are there, you simply update them to look relative to the data. So the element might be a bar in a bar chart. And the height of the bar chart might be relative to some data, some data item. The number of I items, right? So the number of items in your set has to match the number of bars. So if you only have one bar, you select that bar, update it, but then you have to add additional bars for each additional item. A bit tricky to get your mind wrapped around it, but it's, it uses a very similar pattern. And then what you can do is you can select a set of these bars and then manipulate them in some way. Okay? So they do chaining, they do selection, all of that stuff that jQuery does, uh, D3 also does. So it's a great pattern to learn. Not just for jQuery. You might never use jQuery, but still learn the pattern because it's useful in other contexts. Did that? So in addition to being able to add a class, I can also remove a class. So I added a class here, which made everything red. I can also then remove a class, which will send it back to not red. Right. You can uh, remove uh, this, uh, okay. this test class. I can also wait some minutes for my mind. Nice. What does that mean? You can also toggle. So toggle means. If the class exists, remove it. If it doesn't exist, add it. So in this case, if I were to just do what I did, does the class exist or not? Is that class in the DOM or not? No. No. So if I were to get rid of this, the answer is yes. If I were to comment this out, however, I add here and then toggle, which means remove, and then get back to the state. So you might use toggle, for example, suppose you have you know, a drop-down thing, right? And you have a, you know, when you click on it, every time you click on it, you either want it to open up, and then when you click on it, it closes. When you click on it, it open up, when you click on it, it closes. Like a tree, for example, right? You would learn like this. You have like a plus and a minus, right? When you click on the plus, it opens up, click on it again, closes. Well, what you're doing there is you're toggling between two classes. One which would show the content, and one which would not. One which would maybe have a background of a plus, and another which would have a background of a minus. Something like that, right? So that's how you can use this to do DOM manipulation. Okay. So we talked about chaining. So chaining, I mean, gets really interesting. So you, in this case, I'm selecting everything of type div. Let me make a bunch of divs, just for fun. Okay. And then for each one of these divs, I'm selecting it and setting as the inner HTML, hello world. And so every div ends up with a hello world inside. Right? Then what I do is I say dot CSS, and I do font weight of bold. So I make every single one of these bold in one shot. This is what's so powerful about this, guys, is you can perform an operation on a set of nodes in one call. So that really makes your code nice and neat. I can also do dot adder title hello. If you remember, title adds a tooltip. So now every one of these has a tooltip. Okay? Questions so far? Very cool. All right. Okay, so in this case, we have a unordered list which has a class name as the name of the class. Then we have a list item, span, h5, hello, anyway, a bunch of HTML. Then what we do is once the document is ready, is we will find all the LIs in the set and then call first. 
first. Now, what's the difference between first and taking the index of zero? If you were to take the index of zero, it would give you the DOM node, the actual DOM node. When you call first, underneath it calls index zero, but then wraps it in a jQuery object and returns that. Again, the benefit of having a jQuery object is you have access to all of those functions that you can call in order to easily manipulate it. So first, we'll take the first element, wrap it in a jQuery object, return that, and here we're assigning it to s. Okay, so we have s, and then we can from s do s.siblings, so which will get all the siblings, right? Siblings. Okay, you can do next, which will give you the next sibling, or print to get the previous sibling. You can get the parent, so for any element, you can get the parent, you can get the children, you can get the siblings, you can get just the, the, the sibling on this side or just the sibling on this side. So with these very basic functions, you can navigate around the entire DOM. Really useful. You can also call find. What does find do? Find finds, runs this query relative to this set. We saw one more mechanism for doing this, if you guys recall. And that was calling jQuery and passing this as the second argument. Yeah. Another way to do it is if you already have a jQuery object, just do dot find, and it will run this query underneath the elements in the set. So if S has an element here, here, and here, it will find all H5 that are underneath this one, this one, and this one. Okay? You have dot parents which will uh, find all the parents. So starting from any element, it will go up all the way to the top, and along the way, select every element that matches this. Okay? Closest is a really, really useful function. I use it all the time. Closest will find, will go up until it finds an element that matches, and then stops and returns that. When is this useful? Example. Suppose you have a, a, a table with a bunch of rows, right? And then you want to have a delete button. So when you call the delete button, when you press the delete button, you want to, you don't want to just remove the, the delete button. You want to remove the entire row. So you might just call relative to that delete button. When you get the event, you'll get something like e.target or event.target. Target will tell you the thing that was actually clicked on, right? Which, is, which can be the button, for example. And then what you do is you say, find me the closest TR. It will go up and find the table row, and then you just remove the table row. Huh? Kind of cool, right? Okay, so closest is a great function. I highly recommend that you guys study it and, and use it in your code. Um, I also use it for, for example, if I'm decorating my DOM with data, you know, dash, I don't know, user ID. So I'm listing a bunch of people. I don't want to just re remove the element. I want to find the actual ID of that person and remove it from a model, which will then cause the event and the thing will get removed automatically. That's MVC, we'll talk about that later. Well, I need the ID, right? I'm not going to store the ID of the user on every single element inside of that block. So instead what I do is I store it just in the TR, and I do something like closest, uh, so something like, Data dot user slash user ID and then dot dot adder. Once I get to that element, adder. So get me the attribute that has the uh, data user ID. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, dot data. Got got away. Right. Okay. Excuse me, but the select element such. I think I think it is got away. But the connect element. Uh -huh. So for those of you who don't who are a little lost, in addition to calling adder, you can also call get data. And what data will give you is an object that has all the attributes, but it will strip out data, and it will turn all the dashes into camera case. And then you can just reference every attribute inside. It's very useful. 
But again, unless you want to pick multiple attributes, it doesn't make sense because you're creating an extra object and that has order. Now the garbage collector is going to come and clean it up. Right? So when, you, when possible, try to limit how you use objects. Well, this sounds interesting. Okay. So you guys get this pattern, right? I find the closest element that has the ID I want, and then I get it from it, and now I have the ID. I can go to the, to the model and say, remove this person from the list. The model will return that person from the list. Magic happens, and the DOM updates, and that row is removed. We'll get, so the magic is MVC, which is the next thing we'll, we'll cover, so stick around. Questions so far? Okay, let me try this. All right, I get closer to the Oscar Mike and General. General. Okay. You can also, so I mentioned that you can, there are two types of strings that you can pass in. You can pass in selectors, which we've seen, CSS selectors, right? But you can also pass in HTML. So what you can do is you can do dollar pass so call the function and when you call the function you actually put HTML in. So in this case I have H3 wrapped in hello world. It will then convert this into a DOM element. It will parse it, convert it into a DOM element, and then return to a jQuery object that has that element wrapped inside. Okay. So instead of doing something like so the native DOM would be something like document.createElementH3 document, and then you would do that with the return to some bar hello and then you would do hello.innerHTML is equal to hello world So this is how you would do basically this in the native DOM. You can tell that this is a lot more work than just this. Right? And this gives you a jQuery object that is easy to use after the fact. So that's kind of the benefit. Okay. Um, so once you have the hello, inside it has an object, a uh, jQuery DOM node. What you can do is you can do dollar $body. This will select, of course, the body of the HTML, right? Wrap it up in the jQuery object and return that. And then that we can call append. Not append child, just append. Okay. Append child is native. Append. And append, and then you pass in the thing you want to append to it. And now, hello, this element has been added to the body. John. The exchange got up and done a string was the jQuery object. Document fragment. Yes, 
Ich schaue es euch an. Okay? Das ist gar nicht. Uh, right, so you can also remove elements. Now, uh, so what you can do is you can select any element. So you can select every span in the DOM and just call dot remove. And that will remove every span in your DOM. Very simple. Um, you can, there's also a very useful function called replace with. Replace with will basically remove the span, but remember where it was, and then replace that location in the DOM with the thing that you give it. Now the thing that you give it can just be the string, the HTML string. So it will then turn this into a jQuery object and then append it relative to where the span is. Or you can also give it an actual jQuery object. So you can create or your DOM element. The parameters for this are the same as the jQuery function. Okay? So in this case, it will take this, wrap it up in the jQuery, turn it into a DOM element, which will be, uh, yeah, that, and then add it to a jQuery object, and then that jQuery object will get appended to the location where the span was after it's been removed. But guess that's it. It's swapping it, huh? it's removing this and putting this in its place. There's also detail. So in, in jQuery, there are two functions that both kind of do the same thing, but not really. And a lot of people get confused, so pay attention to this. There is a remove function, and there is a detach function. They both will remove the element from the DOM. So in that way, they're the same. But they're very different in a sense that remove will not only remove the element, but it will also disconnect any events that you have added or registered to that or any of its children. Okay? Detach will not. So be careful, don't use detach when you mean remove because you end up with a memory. Right? So why would you use detach rather than remove? Well, detach might be useful if all you're doing is maybe disconnecting so you can connect somewhere else. That might be useful. Remove is what you generally use if you just want to destroy it and you're done, you never want to see it again. Okay? So that's kind of the difference. Is that clear? Yeah? Sure. Yeah, there are 10 domain capats or appendix on the mature push there. Cost them exception, G. Cost them exception. Stays on the master of the DOM. I said, I can't cheat them. By the absence of half, by sense of half. Pitchy, half. Check whether the logic, yes, 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 Չէ, <laughs> This one. Too. Can you replace with the chiquita bar, big bar, bar? Uh, ah, remove the bar. Remember that. Sa span is a hamet. See, it's been. As you are going to ice selector, return on it. Dada. Dot like zero. Yet it's a hamet. events to jQuery. Well, using jQuery, we can add events to the DOM. So let me show you the result, and then I'll show you how we got there. So the result is this. So I can mouse over these things, and notice it changes color. But then when I right-click on hook events, now it doesn't do it anymore. Okay? So what's happening? How did we get here? 
So here's what we do. Again, we start off with the standard. We call jQuery with a document. We call ready. When it's ready, it calls our function, passing in jQuery. Okay? So this, again, watch this. Alert dollar is the same, same thing as window.jQuery. True. I proved it to you. Okay. So let's get rid of that. Bytes is gushay, but the karoga chuli ni. But the which one make a karoga? Oops, sorry. Okay. Well, yeah. How are we going to know which one make a oops kasi jQuery or write down it? Shall I make a kisha kasi which one make a oops kasi dollar kahani? The dollar mi hat tawa. Shall I teach that up open? jQuery gare lu jamanak puti nans agin gare ku mat shat. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, so what's going on here? So uh, forget this function for a second. I select every div. So in this case, I have two divs, right? I have this div and I have that div. I have hello and I have goodbye, and then this one I have a hyperlink. Don't worry about that for now. Um, and then I do on. So on is the mechanism that there are other mechanisms that people used to use, like live and something else, bind, I think, right? Forget oh, on. On is what we're, yeah, they're all deprecated. But on is all you have to know. On. So it's very simple. On is the event. This is the name of the event. So this is mouse enter. You can put in multiple events by putting a space in between. So if I just did this, this would mean to call just button, call that function if mouse enter happens. But because I have mouse enter space mouse leave, it's simple. When the mouse enters the element, it's going to call the function. When the mouse leaves the element, it's going to call the function again. <laughs> Clear, right? What does the function do? So the function takes an ex uh, an, an uh, an event, sorry, an event object, E, which has a type. And the type is the name that will match one of these things. So this will tell you, is this event for this one or for this one? Okay? So either of these will call this. Here you can pick which one it is by comparing the type. So if the type is mouse enter, we know this. Else, there's only one other event, else, we do this. And what do we do? What we're going to do is we're going to do dollar this. Now, what is this? This, in the context of the callback function, refers to the element that the event came from. Okay. So remember, here we selected a bunch of divs, right? Say 25 divs, which were wrapped up in a jQuery object. When one of those divs gets a mouse enter, it will call that function in the context of that particular div in which the, the thing came in. Okay. So this refers to the specific div that raised the event. With me? So what we can do is we can wrap it up in a jQuery object by calling jQuery, giving it the element, getting back a wrapped up jQuery object. And once we have a jQuery object, we can just call add class, give it a class name, and the background will change because this class over has a background of white blue, right? Similarly, if it's not mouse enter, then we assume it's mouse leave, we're going to remove the class. And so the background will go back to the default, whatever it is. Right? Okay, fair enough. So this is how you get sort of mouse in, mouse out kind of behavior, right? Jump. Garlic, use me? Like uh, yeah, yeah. So the gentleman just said, why do why not just do this dot toggle class and then just give it the name and that will uh, yes. But I wanted to show you. So yeah, yes, but yes. Um, so you can also watch this. Uh, you can also do so in this case I'm selecting A, which is the hyperlink, and I'm doing on. And then I'm doing, when, it, when it's clicked, so when you click on the hyperlink, I'm going to call this function with an event. Okay. Um, I'd like to put this on top, actually. Hang on. So the first
first thing I usually do is do this, prevent default. What does prevent default do? It prevents the default behavior of a browser. Now, the default behavior of a browser, when you click on the hyperlink, is to open that hyperlink, right? It looks at the href and then executes it and tries to figure out how to actually resolve that data. Um, yeah, so prevent default tells the browser, those two minutes, I got this, okay? So then we do our work, and what is our work? Our work is to, when this thing is clicked, to remove the event listeners, okay? So here, we're adding the event listeners, but when you click on the, on the hyperlink, I want to remove the event listeners. So we have on to register an event listener, so off to unregister the event listener, right? Okay, so we do, so similarly we select the divs. By the way, we could have stored this div in a variable and just refer to that variable here instead of reselecting the divs, right? That might save us some time. But okay, so we're selecting the divs again. And then for each of those divs, we're doing dot off the names of the, of the events that we want to turn off. Now here's the thing about this. The more specific you are about what to off, the more specific the off will be. If I just called off without any arguments, it would turn all the events that were ever created for those elements off. If I were to get rid of this function here and just do this, it would remove all the event listeners that were ever added that are listening to these two events. Why does that matter? Because I could call on with these two events multiple times with different functions. Okay. Yeah? So if I specify the function, it's saying specifically for this combination, off that combination. So undo exactly this, no more. Okay. So if you include everything back here, it will specifically remove this. If you include less stuff, it might remove other things as well. Okay. Ah, and I'm also, by the way, doing this, and what is this? Remember, I added the event listener to a hyperlink, so when this is called, this is the hyperlink. It's A. So when I call this, I'm going to wrap it in the dollar and call off. Click. Now again, notice, I'm only calling click. I'm not passing a second function. So if somewhere else in my code, someone else or another algorithm, or maybe me, added another on click to that hyperlink, it will off all of them. All of them. John. So you have two times of event. Is that okay? Yes, and they use event. Ah, no, it's not okay, actually. How's that the score? Which year is Bolo browser net is match. Check, 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 check. Check, 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 check. Check, 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 check. No, no. You, you take the local event that jQuery gives you, and then you call for event defaults on that event. Because this is a function. So even if, if event happened to be, like in an Internet Explorer that happened to be a global event, it would not have this function. So no, no, no. You can't do that. You take the event, you call for event defaults to stop it, and then you do whatever operations you want to do. Okay? Other questions before I keep going? John. Melvin? Ah, okay. So, it basically, it's the operation to do nothing. I, now, I don't use this anymore. I just do this. Uh, but because you prevent default, you can also uh, stop the immediate propagation in case you have other listeners above. Um, this, I like this because it's shorter. And I like shorter. I mean, anything I can do less, I like it. Right? So um, use this, I would recommend. But the other one just means do nothing. So what do you mean on and bind? Uh, bind is old and deprecated. On is is not. <laughs> okay. But. 
listen to, for example, click events from anything that matches, let's say, the class remove row. Right? So now you will get, a, anytime any one of these buttons is clicked, you will get the event. Once you have the event, you use closest to find the closest TR. You get the ID of the user or whatever value it is that you're rendering in that row. Remove it from your model, and then the rest will happen. Okay, so this is one way to approach this. Clear so far? Questions? Dot click. Yes, that's deprecated too. So yeah, you could, so right, so a lot of these events, you can just do dot name of the event, which seems like it's shorthand, but they, they're trying to standardize on the on. So just use on everywhere, okay? Forget about all the other stuff. Uh, other questions? Okay. Can we have a break? Yes, we, thank you. I would love a break. Wait, don't move. <laughs> all right, let's do this. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay. So, in reality, there are lots of methods. There are lots of events. There's a big list of them. We, we talked about click. We talked about uh, mouse enter and mouse leave. There's a huge list of these. You guys can find them at jQuery on the jQuery website. Um, so use them however you like. All right. Let's talk about animation. Now, before I mention animation, let me just say one thing that's kind of important. It was actually the gentleman reminded me last time. So there are kind of there are two approaches to animation in the DOM. One is to use JavaScript. The other is trying to use CSS transitions. Um, so CSS transitions are not something that I'll have time to cover. But it is something that I urge all of you guys, especially those of you who don't really know what that is, to look into it and give it a try. So the advantage of using CSS transitions over actual JavaScript is that CSS transitions use the GPU and it's really fast. It actually runs on a separate thread, so you don't get that blocking problem, the garbage collection problem that I mentioned, where the garbage collector interrupts your thread. All of that, all those problems are actually stripped out the moment you start using CSS transitions. But again, remember that CSS transitions are part of HTML5, uh, or CSS3, which I guess falls under that category. Um, so they're not in older browsers. So know which browsers support them and use them when you can. But in situations where you do have to actually, in JavaScript, animate something, uh, one way to do it is to basically write like a set timeout loop, which is what we did way back, if you remember, we animated the flag. Um, so you do something like window set timeout, and we give it some timer, and then after each timer, you make some change to the DOM. So jQuery uh, makes this stuff a lot easier. So what does jQuery do? So I have a div here, which, um, here it is, it has a background of red, it has a width and a height, and there it is. Right? There it is. When I click on it, woo, it, it grows. All right, let's, let's see that one more time. When I click on it, zoom. It sort of sh it gets bigger, and then the, the, the inner content is replaced or set to all done. All right. Okay, so simple. Okay, I get that. So how, how do we actually get something like that to work? So what we do is we select the div, which in this, oh, so first of all, we select a button. So in here, we have a button. We select the button and we add, oops, you didn't see that. Uh, okay, yeah. Ah, no, it's just on. Okay, so when the button <laughs> when the button is so on click of, of the things that match this, which is the button, we are going to call this function. And what does this function do? Internally, it will select all the divs, which we just have one, and it will call animate. And what animate does is it takes an object that specifies the resulting values. So remember, the width of the, of the div started off at 30 pixels, right? Width, right? 30 pixels. Here I'm saying width 400 pixels. And then I'm also saying height to 100 pixels. So I'm changing, so I'm kind of saying change the height and width to this. But animate the change. Okay? CSS transitions also kind of work like this. You basically change the CSS. And it looks at what CSS exists then, what CSS you want, and it makes the transition from this to that very smooth. It animates it, and you can set timers and stuff like that. Here you set the timer some, somewhere here. So this means make the animation last about 500 milliseconds. So the bigger this number, the slower it's going to grow. The smaller this number, the faster it's going to grow. So, and then what you can do is you can give it a callback. Now, the callback will get called once the animation completes. Right. So, what this is saying is animate this thing out, and when it's done, call this function. And what does this function do? It selects this. What is this in this context? The div. That's right, the div that we are animating. We will select that div, we wrap it in, we call jQuery, it gives us a wrapped jQuery object, and then we call .html which will set this as the inner HTML of that. And so after it's finished animating, we see all done. Simple, right? Good, let's keep going. We have Ajax. Okay, so here's the demo. Okay, so the demo is very simple. So jQuery has a function. So we're not, so here's the thing. We know that dollar is jQuery, right? And jQuery is a function. 
But remember, in JavaScript, functions are also objects. That's right. So just like any other object, we can attach additional attributes to that object. Right? So one of the things that they've attached to the dollar function or object is the Ajax function. An Ajax function does what you think it does. It allows you to make Ajax calls. In other words, HTTP calls to the server. So you specify something like the address, the type, whether you want to do an HTTP get or post, put, delete, whatever. Uh, you specify the type. In this case, we're dealing with JSON. So when it comes back, it's actually going to parse through JSON and get come back as JSON. Then data, this is the actual data that gets sent to the server as parameters. So if you do uh, a get, those are the arguments. If you do the post, that goes into the body. Right? And then you have success, which is called, one, if everything comes back A-OK, -okay, success comes back and data is the data that is actually parsed from JSON into JavaScript because of this. And so this is actual data. We don't have to parse it. We don't have to do JSON.parse or anything like that. And so we get the data here, and then we do $.each. Now, $.each is the same thing as, how do I explain $.each? So in newer libraries, arrays have this, .each, um, or for each, I should say, for each, yeah, it's chemical, it's for each. Um, actually, most libraries, like underscore, they have an underscore dot for each. For some reason, I don't know why, jQuery just called it each. I think it's historical reasons. They did it first and then other people maybe out of here. So what does each do? Well, it's very simple. So it says for the given array, or the given list of stuff, iterate through each one and call this function. Okay? That's all it does. I could have just as easily turned this into a for loop, where I said for each, you know, i equals zero, i is less than i you know, data dot items dot length, i plus plus. So the reason why you would want to use something like this rather than a for loop is if you're doing things in here, you know what, I'll give you an example later with set timeout. In fact, as almost a, a test, and then we'll see and then we'll figure out how to solve it. So we'll cover this later. But for all you need to know right now is that it will read, for every value in this array, it will call this function. That's all you have to know. Okay, so it's calling this function, what does this do? It basically appends to the body some stuff, in this case an image, um, yeah. body append image with a source that takes item.media.app. Don't, don't worry about what that is. Um, this is just the Flickr API. And so what you get is a whole bunch of images representing that. If I were to change the query to, instead of Armenia to say, um, Boston, this will take a while. Oh, there it is, there's Boston. Oh yeah, oh, that's MIT. It's a car. Okay, cool. All right, so you get the idea. Now, notice how Ajax forces you to put all these values in it, right? So how can we make this smaller? How can we make it simpler? Well, what jQuery did is it added get JSON. So instead of specifying all that other stuff, people often just do an HTTP get request to get JSON to you. That's a usual request, right? So instead of specifying all that other stuff, you can just say get JSON, give it the address, and then the, the parameters. And then when it's done, it will just call this callback, and you can do the same thing. That's just easier. It does the same thing underneath. It can just as easily be calling the same methods, but it's easier to use. So if all you need to do is get JSON, just use get JSON. It's easier. Um, Okay, so this is the last thing we're going to do in jQuery, is to learn how to write plugins. Now, in order, this will also help you understand how plugins work. So when you use them, even if you don't write them, I think it will be some benefit to you. Um, so what do we do here? So typically the way you write one of these is you, well, remember, you don't want to put anything in the global scope, right? So immediately we know that we need to wrap things into a self-executing function, right? So that it's encapsulated in the scope. Do you remember this? Okay, so this is our code. Now, jQuery is global, right? But we want to use it locally. So what we do is we take jQuery, we pass it in as an argument, and it comes back here as a local variable. Okay? So that's what this does. Now we have jQuery. Now what we want to do is we want to contribute a function to jQuery. How do we contribute a function to jQuery? Well, remember, this is a function. 
jQuery is a function, right? We do dollar dot fn dot some name of a function. Now, what the heck is fn? Remember prototype? That's what that is. It's just an alias to prototype. That's all that is. They thought that writing prototype would be scary and complicated and people would freak out. So they made it so that dot prototype, dot, you know, the function dot fn is equal to the object dot prototype. So fn is the same thing as the prototype. So all you're doing here is you're adding to the prototype of this function constructor, actually, this method. Ah. So the cool thing about adding it to the prototype is that if you already have instances of the jQuery object in your, in your code, by adding it to the prototype, all of those objects now inherit that function. Because all of them are referencing, have a proto unders underscore underscore proto underscore underscore reference to this object right here. And so if we add a function to it, now everybody has access to that function. Prototypal inherit is kind of cool. Alright. Okay, so um, so to the prototypal object, we add some function, and that function can be, you know, whatever you want. It can be pop-up, it can be dialogue, it can be whatever type of thing that you want to add to jQuery. And then you set that to a function, which and this is actually what you do. This is where you put your code. Now typically what you do if you've used jQuery. You know that generally the first thing you do when you, you know, you have some selection and then you do dot, you know, pop up, you often pass in an object which specifies kind of the initial settings you want, like, you know, whether you want it to come up on its own or if you want it to be a manual click or if you want it to be some size, what you want the content to be, whatever options that the plugin will allow you to set. You will generally put that into an options parameter. Now, options is an object, right? But what you want to do is, a lot of times, these options are optional. Options. They're optional. There should be default values for every option. So, a simple way to figure all this out is to do, to create an object, this is the object here, that has the default values that you want. Now, if the user specifies options, what you can do is you can mix in these options into this object. What do I mean by mix in? Mix in basically means you iterate over every attribute inside of this object and you write it into this object. So you over so whatever options are in here will override the values that are in here and get returned into this variable. Yeah. Okay. So once we have that, then what we want to do is remember jQuery takes a list of stuff, right? A jQuery object has a list of items in it, potentially, right? Zero or more items, right? Remember this. So what we want to do is, whatever we want to apply, we can't just apply to one element. We have to apply to the entire set. So how do we apply it to the entire set? We do this, which is the jQuery object, dot each. Each will iterate over every element inside of the jQuery object. And for each one, call your function. Okay, we got that. So for each one of those, we will do something like, you know, dollar this to get a reference to it, and then do whatever you want to do to that element. Whether you want to add additional um, HTML to it, whether you want to add event listeners to it, that's up to you. But this is where you actually do the main part of your now the other thing you will also have to do, and this is really, really important, is you have to make sure that you return the jQuery object itself. You can either return it here by doing just return this, or each is another function on this, and remember, every function on this returns this. Remember, that's how you do chaining. So if you just do return, this each will return jQuery object, which will return the jQuery object. Why? Because someone might call your function and then do dot CSS. And if you don't return the jQuery object in your function, you will break the chain and you will get exceptions. How many people do not get that? I feel like I didn't explain it very well. You didn't get that. Okay. Okay, think of it this way. Just very good. I have a, uh, an object for our option, which 
which has in it a member called foo. Okay? Now, if I just call ob.foo, oh, let's, let's give it another function called bar. Okay? Now, if I call obs.foo, great, but I want to do something like this, dot bar. This is what I want to do. Now, the problem is, foo doesn't return anything, right? So it's undefined. So it returns undefined, and if I try to do undefined dot bar, I get errors, right? So in order for, for this to actually work, what I have to do is have foo return this, and then ideally just have bar also return this. So that I can just do dot bar, dot foo, dot foo, dot bar. You get the idea. Now imagine taking this idea but applying it to all the functions within the jQuery object. So every object will return the jQuery object so you can call the next function. And this one. What's wrong with the classical inheritance so in order to use prototype inheritance? Uh, say that one more time. What's wrong with the classical inheritance uh -huh. in order to use prototype inheritance? What do you mean by what's wrong with it? Why to use it? In which I guess you have to move to the classical. What is my classical? What is it? Not classical, but classical around the country. This is not so far as around the country. Ha, apply that over, call that over. Ha, 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 hard to Ha, okay, uh, ease of use. Uh, think of it this way. Um, you're, you're not you. You're you know, a designer who wants to use jQuery. Okay? And what you want to do is you want to just you know, quickly add, let's say, a tooltip to a div, and then maybe you know, change the background of that div to red. Right? So what that means is that you want to just quickly, on one thing, not go through documentation and find all the other objects that might have that function, but just on that one function, get access to all the functions you want. And the additionally, what you want to do is you don't want to then do one line and then set that to a variable and then do another line. You just want to do oh, dum, dum, and done. So you have terse code, small code. It's just it's it's e it's easier to use that way. Did that kind of answer your question or not really? Not really. If you're not satisfied. This is the standard answer that I have to say. I, I, I don't really understand the real difference between those two. A real difference between this and that. Maybe, uh, maybe later I will come to you. Okay, yeah, yeah. 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 And, then, and then once we sort it out, then I'll introduce it to the. Yeah, that's, that sounds great. Uh, other questions? Yes, sir. Ah, Next question. Junk. Widget and Junk. jQuery widget or jQuery plugin? This is not jQuery UI, but then you have that. Ah, it's not a lot of Եկու խոսքով չեմ կարող ասել, բայց մի կիշավերի շատ խոսքերը, նա այդ ինչ է կանում, եթե սենց ասեմ, չեքորի ուջիտ կլասը հեղ, որ իտ պրոտայպով պատ, ինքը ենթադրում են, ենթադրում են, որով էտը դոջոներ մի ուջիտ ու Հատի որ ինչ-որ ավելոտ բաներ է տարին։ Ինչ-որ։ Մի ատ երկմատ վուրսան մինեմ ուղ, 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 ենց է ձեզ պետ կեն էր վուրսաները, ու պետ կա է սուրտուրան, ով տարվոց է։ Բայց հետ է սրանով գիոլակը գնա Ah, 
Arsenal image, or some array of then, or this young prototype function is mega for each, right? For each, right? Camel is. Okay, Right? 
right? So it's a very useful, easy to use thing. Okay, so typically you have that, that as being your model or your data, okay? It's stored in this JavaScript object. And then you have a view that attempts to render or draw some values or you know, attributes that are stored in that object. And then typically you have this little controller that sits in between and kind of makes sure that everything is happy and dandy. The thing is, uh, in the current implementation of JavaScript, there are no events that will fire when the JSON or the JavaScript object is modified. Okay. In the new ECMAScript 7, I think, there is 6 or 7, for sure. You're sure? I'm pretty sure it's the, the one I'm talking about is 7, where you can add uh, property change events, object, uh, object property change or something. Observe that. Isn't that 7? Is that 6? Whatever. In the newer version. <laughs> by the way, ECMAScript is a standard way of saying JavaScript. It's the standard for JavaScript, right? Because Java is owned by, actually now Oracle, it used to be Sun, so we can't use Java, so we say ECMAScript. Same thing. Okay, so. Uh, right, so right now, right now in your browsers, there's really no way to know when that JavaScript object is modified, when it changes, okay? So if I were to just go and override some property from Joe to Mike, there would be no event that would say, the name attribute changed, update the view, ah, nothing. It's, shh, no one knows. Now this is a major problem, and lots of different libraries have approached solving this problem in different ways. And this, I would say, as far as at least client-side development in the browser, is the biggest problem uh, for writing clean data binding code. So by data binding, I mean taking this data here and binding it, in other words, rendering it and keeping it up to date in the view that is over here. Okay? So if you have name here that says Mike, you might have an H1 here that in site says Mike, and if you change the name here, you want to update it here. And if you change in a text box a name here, you want it to write back into the object. Okay, so this is known as two-way data binding. So how do libraries approach this? Well, there are different ones. Backbone creates, has this notion of a model. Um, it's, I understand, a model we usually refer to as data. But it's basically this object that wraps a JavaScript object. And what it does is it forces you to, whenever you want to modify something, to modify that value through methods in that model. Specifically, Backbone has a get and a set. So a get, obviously, so you get, you get an attribute name and it gives you the value. You can do a set where you give it an attribute name and then the value, and it will set it, of course. You can also set an object, just like in CSS, we could pass in an object with lots of parameters. You have something like that in, uh, in background. But because you're doing all of your modification, all of your reading, all of your writing, everything you're doing through Backbone, Backbone knows that you've touched it. Backbone knows that you've changed this attribute or that attribute, right? So because Backbone knows that you changed it, Backbone has the, uh, the information in order to properly raise an event. Okay? So you can raise an event saying name changed, and specifically it changed from Joe to Mike. And then you might have another piece of code that is listening to that change event that will then respond to that change and appropriately update the DOM. Right? So that's kind of the approach that Backbone took. Um, Knockout took a different approach. Knockout has this notion of observables. What are observables? Observables are these objects that you wrap the value of each property with. Okay? So if you have a name property, the value of the name property is not Joe, it's an observable object that hosts the value of Joe. And all the changes that you make, you make through the observable. So, they, so basically you call the observable, which will return the value, or you call the observable with a value, and that will set the value inside the observable. Okay? By the way, everyone understands what I'm saying? That one? So, that's the approach that Knockout takes. Knockout also has this notion of computed functions. Now, this is actually really important because this is actually, in my opinion, one of the problems with Angular. Suppose you want to write a function that concatenates the first name and the last name and returns it. Okay? What you would do is you would write a computable or computed function. 
And what that does is you would read the computed, not the, the observable first name, the observable last name, get the values, concatenate them, and return the value. What NACAT understands is when it calls your function, it listens to what observables you're calling. It says, oh, this function called first name, first name, this function called last name, last name, and then the function returns with a value. Why is this important? Because now I know the two things that that function relies on. And if either of those two things change, I know to recall that function. This, this is called depend, dependent observables, right? So this depends on this, right? So, right, whereas in Angular, which takes a very different approach, one of the big problems with writing a function that returns a value is Angular doesn't know specifically what values you took or you read in order to compute that value. So it will, every time the scope changes, I'll get to this later, it will re-execute that function every time can see that there's a problem, or there's a potential performance problem. So you have to be very careful about how you use functions or computed functions in, in Angular. Again, Knockout tries to be very accurate, but at the same time, Knockout forces you to wrap all of your values in these observable things. Now, next time we meet, which will be the day after tomorrow, right, so Wednesday, again, same place, same time, kind of vibe, we will actually go through the code. We'll actually see how these observables are wrapped in Knockout. We'll actually see how models work in Backbone. And then once we get a sense of, you know, okay, here's Backbone and here's what it provides. Here's Knockout, here's what it provides. And now here's Angular, here's, and you will understand why Angular works that way, what the benefits are, what the trade-offs are. And I think this is really, really important. Because I often hear people ask me, well, why Angular, why not Knockout? Why Knockout, why not Backbone? What? Well, you have to know what's good and bad about each. There is no answer. I will never say always use Angular. I will never say always use Knockouts. It depends on what you're doing. And depending on what you're doing, you have to know the strengths and weaknesses of each project to select the best one. Now, of course, outside of the scope of, the, of this class, there are lots of other sort of MVC frameworks out there, right? There's Ember, there's Spine, so many I don't even, a whole bunch I don't even know. Um, really, really great ones, which I will strongly urge you guys to at least study. Maybe not use, but at least study. And the reason for this is because when you have a project, you can then pick the, most, the optimal one. The last thing you want to do is write a spreadsheet using Angular, and then realize the spreadsheet got too long, and you have performance problems with Angular, and then say, oh, Ruben told me to use Angular, I hate this guy. I never told you to use anything. I'm just going over stuff. What stuff you decide to use is entirely up to you. I'm more than happy to talk to you and to discuss the pros and cons, but the ultimate decision must lie with you. Okay, four minutes, well, I guess I could let you guys go sooner rather than later. Thank you guys so much for coming. Uh, I'll see you guys the day after tomorrow. So Wednesday, 10 o'clock, same time, same place. Backbone, knockout, angular. Thank <laughs> you.